we talked about how to write the equilibrium constant. Um, and basically, you write it as the products of the reaction divided by the reactants. And then the stoichiometric coefficients are used as exponents, right? Exponents to the concentrations. And remember, these brackets uh, represent that new term, molarity, that we just sort of talked about yesterday. That's the moles of stuff per liter of solution. The other thing we said was if K is big, like if the value, the number that you get from K is large, uh, then we would say it's product favorite because there's more products than there's reactants and the number that you have for K is really small. Like 10 to the minus something, right? 0. 0.0000, however you want to think of being really small. If the number's like that, then what that means is uh, it's very reactant favored because for that to be true, for K to be less than 1, right? This concentration for NO up here, 2, NO2, has to be smaller than this, which means products are smaller than reactants. And reactants are larger, so that means it's reactant favored. All right. So we're going to talk about something called the Chatelier's principle, and, and this actually gets used a lot. This concept, um, and you kind of intuitively know it already. Um, so let's go over the Chatelier's principle. Let me define it first, okay? So to define the Chatelier's principle, the first thing is if you have a reaction and it's at equilibrium. So you have a reaction at equilibrium. And we'll define that a little bit. We'll, we'll, we'll clarify what that means in a second. All right. Response to a change. Okay. And we'll talk about what a change means. I'm, gonna, I'm making some space on the right-hand side so I can write some notes. A reaction at equilibrium responds to a change to minimize the change. So just remember, a reaction at equilibrium, I have reactants, at, and, I, and they're making products. And at the same time, I have products being turned into reactants. So I have these two things going on. So I wrote it like that because the way we actually write it is we write reactants in equilibrium with products, but this, this is what that means. I have two reactions going at the same time. So I have a forward rate of reaction and I have a reverse rate of reaction, is what we say. So this is you know going from reactants to products, that's the way I wrote the reaction, that's the forward way, and from the products to reactants, that's the reverse way. Okay, so when the rates are equal, that's when it's at equilibrium. When, when these two are equal, that's what we mean by equilibrium. And that's why when you look at a reaction at equilibrium, the product concentration, the reacting concentration, they don't change anymore. It's not that the reactions stop. They could be going very fast. Like some reactions, uh, in a second, right, the reaction will have taken place between molecules like 10 to the 15th times. So think about that. So like it's like a billion, right, would be 10 to the 9th. A trillion would be 10 to the 12th. So it's whatever is after that. That's a lot of times for a reaction to happen in just one second. So there's some of these reactions that are super fast. But at the same time, when the reaction reaches equilibrium, the concentrations aren't changing. It's just that the molecules are going from reactants to products to react products to reactants back and forth really quickly. So so reaction, when we have a reaction in the equilibrium responds to a change. So what we mean by a change is going to be defined below, but it's like a change in concentration. Per 
pressure. Volume. These are the ones that we're talking about. And temperature. And it says response to a change to minimize the change. So what does that mean? If you make the, if, so think about it like in, in graphical terms, here's a bar graph, right? So, so if I make the change this big, the reaction response to, to try to minimize that makes it smaller. So if I add a mole of material to the reaction, uh, then what it does is it uses some of that up to make that less. And so we'll talk about that in some of these examples. But what it does is it literally tries to take what you did and undo it. Okay. So let's do concentration real quick. And I have 2A plus B plus makes 2C. Sort of a random, uh, random uh, reaction. And let's say I increase A. So I'm going to make this go like this. And that's the change I'm making. Okay. What the reaction does is takes the reactant and makes more product out of it. So what's going to happen is this reaction is going to shift in this direction. So if it was at equilibrium, then what happens is, let me make the arrow a little bit bigger. This reaction is going to go faster. This one maybe won't change very much. And as a, as a result, this concentration that we're talking about, C over here, the concentration of C will be going up. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is the change right here. And then this is the result of the change. This is increasing. So let's say if this sounds right. If I add a reactant, I get more product. That makes more sense. That's actually what that says. If I add a reactant, I'll get more product. Right. That's the Chatelier's principle. But there's a lot of different things that happen because of that idea. But chemists use this all the time. So if you need to make more of something, then what you do is you add more of the reactant, that kind of thing. But here's, 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 that's a kind of a way that very clearly makes sense to people. Add more reactant, get more product. But here, here's the thing that's kind of weird about this, okay? This is the part that people, that it's harder to understand. But it says, like, if I take the product out, like if I remove this, if I make this my change, right? Then what happens is this rate of reaction doesn't change. Let's see. Because I haven't done anything with the reactant. That, like, is this how fast the reaction went. The size of that arrow is how fast it's going. This one slows down. And it has the same relative effect. The result is, if you take the product out, you get more product. <laughs> right? Kind of, kind of makes sense. If you take out the product of the reaction, you'll get more product out of the reaction. Now, it's for different reasons, right? One is you make the forward rate bigger. And so you get more product out. That's the one that makes sense to us. But the one that doesn't always make sense is it's just like, well, if I take the product out, then I'll get more product out. I mean, the reaction will yield more product. And people use this all the time to make, like, like sometimes the stuff that you're reacting is very expensive. In order to, to maximize the use of that material, you just, instead of adding more of it, you just remove the product and eventually you can use it all up. So this only 
works if you're talking about concentrations, right, that you can change. And, and it turns out this is a type of reaction. It's known as a heterogeneous equilibrium. The reason that it's heterogeneous is because you have different phases involved. So I have uh, aqueous, a solid, and an aqueous. So just know this and then see if you can understand the reasoning. Uh, if, if, if I add more of the solid, it has no effect. If I take the solid out, it has no effect. In a heterogeneous equilibrium, changing the amount of solid doesn't do anything. So like these, have no effect, so you can just ignore those. Yeah. It, does, it doesn't mean that they don't get used up or anything like that, but if, if you change, well, okay, uh, let's do this. If I have a cube of water, like okay, a water cube, and I wanted to calculate the concentration, this is H2O, okay? What would I do, right? Concentration, like in molarity units, is like moles per liter, right? So you would say, how many moles do I have? And what is the volume of that, that cube? And you could calculate that out. And you would get a value for the molarity that would you know, we calculate as M. What if I make the cube half as big? Like I cut it in half. I take the, just literally chop it and throw half of it away. How does that change its concentration, right? So I, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to make the cube this big now. So that's half the size, half the mass of water, right? How does that affect the number of moles if I cut the mass in half? It's half, right? Because I take half the material and I throw it away. I have half the material to start with. Then what will happen is the moles will be one half the original number of moles. What happens to the volume, though, if I take half of it and throw it away? It's half, right? It's half the volume. And so what ends up happening is your molarity is the same. So, so in these problems, in, the, in this, this concept of Le Chatelier's principle, is built in this idea is that if, if something's concentration doesn't change, it doesn't actually affect how much you get at equilibrium. Only the things whose concentrations change. And that's why in equilibrium constants, they're written like this with molarities. Right? Only the things whose concentrations change actually affect the equilibrium. And so in heterogeneous reactions, when we're doing this Le Chatelier's principle idea, we just ignore the solids and liquids too. Because liquids, it turns out the same way. Because... The way I did this, I said it's water, right? So it could have been a nice cube or it could have actually been a volume of water and I cut it in half. It would have the same, the same argument applies, the same reasoning applies. Now, let me just point out one other thing. When I, when I did this, when I made that, that concentration of, of C go down and then the reaction produced more C, this went down too. It got dragged along. So I can use more of my reactant up, right? That's what I was saying. You can use more of the reactant up by using, taking some of the product out. And so this is the idea of Le Chatelier's principle. Now, the same idea applies for gases. And we haven't talked about pressures, but we're just going to say pressures, uh, we'll say P, right? Is proportional to concentration. So it has the same effect, like changing the pressure of one thing has the same effect as changing uh, the concentration of something. It's so weird in one of these down. You like my periodic table of dogs cup? 
It's a bunch of different dogs on the periodic table. I liked it. I also have the more serious like periodic table with elements cut. But that's just more fun anyways. So here's a reaction. It's decomposition of ammonia. Um, it, at two ammonia, right? Decom can be decomposed to nitrogen and to hydrogen gas. If I increase this, if the argument is the same, right, this before, increasing the pressure of ammonia, what is the reaction going to do? Yeah, move to the right. So we'll say it shifts to the right. That's the terminology. It'll shift in this direction. So what ends up happening is the forward arrow gets bigger than the reverse arrow. The reverse arrow doesn't really change. But the forward arrow gets bigger, right? So the net is it's going to the right. So you'll get more N2 and you'll get more H2. So that's, that's an application. Yeah, we'll show this principle. What if I decrease that? All right, I decrease the reactant, decrease the pressure of the reactant. And then what Lachatley's principle says, what? It'll shift the other way. It'll shift to the left. So it'll be like this arrow. The reverse arrow doesn't change because it's really dependent on the concentration of the products. But the forward arrow gets smaller. And as a result, it shifts left. And so stuff on the right goes down. So one last one, and this is the hardest one to think about in this example. What happens when I make the pressure, let's say I get rid of the nitrogen. Let's say I reduce the amount of N2 gas. Okay. Well, if I decrease the amount of N2 gas, what'll happen is the reverse rate so the forward rate's not affected because the forward rate is dependent on the reactants. The reverse rate is dependent on the product. So if I make this concentration of N2 go down, the reverse rate decreases and it shifts to the right. So the reaction will go towards the right and you'll use up your NH3. This will go down. But what happens to the H2 then? It'll go up. Because the reaction, because you've made this change in N2, stops going this way as much, but the forward reaction is still going that way. Then what ends up happening is that H2 goes up. Right? So it'll do that. Again, the, the double arrow is the thing that you're doing. It's the change that you're making. And so really, you just have to watch to see what that's doing and which way it makes the reaction want to go left or right. I, just, I did not zoom that. Right. Next couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> if energy, if a reaction is exothermic, when we talk about exothermic, What does that mean? Exo, yeah, releases energy, right? That means energy is a product. How do you add energy to a reaction? You heat it up, right? Yeah, you're heating it up. Yeah, energy, when we talk about energy, we're talking about like temperature. So if you, wanted to, if you wanted to add energy to a reaction, you heat it up. Now, notice in this one, this is an exothermic reaction. Because, because it's producing energy. If I heat the reaction, I'm increasing temperature. 
And you think of energy as a product of the reaction. Which way does the reaction want to go? It's going to shift to the left. It's going to come this way. So the result is B goes down, A goes up. Well, I had an idea. I can write in different colors. So exothermic reactions, when you heat them, will produce more reactants. If you wanted more product, what do you have to do? You have to cool it down. You remove heat from the reaction, and it'll pro progress towards the products. Now, for an endothermic reaction, that means it's a reaction that absorbs energy. The abbreviation for reaction is RxN. I don't know why. Seems to make sense. Um, endothermic reaction absorbs energy. That's why it makes its surroundings colder. So that means energy is a reactant. I'm just going to call it E. Just to abbreviate a little bit. So what happens when I heat an endothermic reaction, right? So I heat, that is increase T. What's going to happen? Yeah, you shift right, you get more products. So endothermic reactions, if you heat them, you can get more products. Exothermic reactions, if you cool them, you'll get more products. I mean, they're the opposites of each other because energy is either on the left or the right-hand side of the reaction. So what it happens is, is it'll shift this way. So that means you'll get more product and less reactant. There's a couple more examples of this are actually on the next set of slides, which unfortunately... I didn't upload till this morning because I was up really late last night editing them and worrying about the class because that's what I do. Uh, actually, let's do this. Let's let you guys finish writing those notes and then I'll shift over to the next thing and then uh, we'll do some calculations and we'll take a short break. Okay, we'll do the next one. This is at 2319. Okay, so we're going to talk about volume, and <clears throat> this is kind of like the hardest one, sort of, to describe out of the, like, the whole thing. Be because um, the description involves, to, to my knowledge, something only like chemists and like physicists think about it's like one of these like you don't really think about reactions happening this way but imagine that i have this reaction and it's in this container so this is a piston okay and i take this piston and i can change the volume of the container right so so there's moles, molarities, there's pressures, we talk about temperatures, and now we're going to talk about volume changes, right? And I have this reaction, 2NH3, actually let me just write it like this, you have NH3 in here, you have N2, and you have H2. Um, when we think about a reaction, unfortunately, we think and fortunately, I think we're sorting out information. We have reactants and we have products, right? And you think of those as separate things, but when you really think about them, when you have a reaction, they're all in the same container. They're all within the same space. And so one of the kinds of problems that chemists think about is what happens if you decrease the volume of the container, okay? Or increase the volume of the container. 
So like I'm going to make it go down like this, or I'm going to make it go up. I'm going to make it either go down or up. All right. So gases are, are associated with a unit called pressure. And most of you intuitively understand pressure. Like you fill up your car tires. The higher the pressure, right, the harder the tire gets. Well, actually what you're doing is you're putting moles of material in your tire. You don't think about it that way, but that's how you get your tire to fill up. So, so what's happening is if I make this volume smaller, the pressures all go up. That makes sense? So like a bicycle pump, right? And you got, you, let's say you, it says you've all probably done this before, I hope. Anybody not ever used a bicycle pump? <laughs> Like some of you are like, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. So, so, but when you put it in there, you can imagine when you push it down, it gets harder and harder to push as you push it down. <laughs> the reason it does that is because as you, the, the, a bicycle pump basically looks like that, except for it has a valve on the bottom. That's where the valve is at the bottom, by the way, that thing comes out of them. You push it, right? And you push the gas out, but in order to get the gas out and into the tire, You've got to squeeze it and increase the pressure. That's what you're feeling when you push the bicycle pump down. You're feeling the pressure created by the gas. And so decreasing the volume increases the pressures of all those gases that are at equilibrium. So I always say it this way, and then it helps people remember, but it's kind of a crude example. When you have gas, what do you try to do with it? <laughs> right, try to let it out quietly. Subtly, but everybody knows, right? Yeah, you try to let it out. So, so what happens is in a chemical reaction, the reaction will shift so that you have less gas. Okay? The reaction does exactly the same thing. So you notice over here, I have four moles of gas. And then over here, there's two moles of gas. So which side has more gas? The right side. So when I increase the pressure, it goes to the left. Right. So in, increasing pressure, that means decreasing the volume. That's the way they'll say it, which doesn't make any sense unless you know the whole context. Like you have a piston and the reactions in the piston, and you decrease the volume, right? Then this reaction will shift in this direction to relieve the pressure. So that means the moles of NH3 go up. N2 goes down, H2 goes down. And that happens without you adding anything to it. It just shifts to a different equilibrium position is what we would say. In fact, uh, prior to World War I, I think it was, the, one of the things that people wanted to make, because fertilizer was a big deal to increase increased crop production and fertilizer contains actually a lot of ammonia okay um, that's why you know when they talk about those bombs that they make out of fertilizer and diesel fuel all right the fertilizer is actually just ammonia it contains a lot of ammonia. so um they wanted to make a lot of nh3 it ended up being that eventually they figured out you could make bombs and so when world war one came around they wanted to make bombs, and so they really wanted a lot of NH3. Right. It became important, this reaction became important, because what it says is if you just run the reaction at higher pressure, you'll get more ammonia. And that's how one of the ways they increase the yield of ammonia is by increasing the pressure of the reaction. The other thing they did is they changed the temperature. I think it's an endothermic reaction, so they heated it and ran it at high pressure and we're able to get really high yields of ammonia, but otherwise it was really hard to get a lot of ammonia. Yeah, anyways. Double-edged sword, got a lot of fertilizer, made a lot of food, and then killed people with it. You know, kind of like, huh, weird. Okay, so increased volume is the opposite. Maybe I should write it so you can read it. I'll have to increase volume. Right, what's it going to do? Increase the volume is going to decrease the pressure, right? And so when the pressure decreases, it's going to shift to the side with more moles. And so it'll go this way. So 
NH3 would go down, and these would go up. N2 and H2 would go up. So one of the things we have to do, oh, so any questions on that? That's called Le Chatelier's principle, because the guy who came up with it, his name was Le Chatelier. Um, so if there's anything else about that. I think that's all. Um, last thing in this chapter, at least the way I've arranged it, it's the middle of the, of the actual chapter, is actually doing calculations with equilibrium constants. Um, I will put one or two of the simpler ones on the test, um, but I don't think it's really that appropriate for like Chem 3A to know how to do all these calculations. And, by, and, and you can ask Adam, these calculations can get pretty hairy, because right? he's already been through Chem 1B. They get really, they can get really ugly. So, yeah, they, so anyways, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate an equilibrium constant. So it says, <clears throat> equilibrium concentrations for the following reaction are, and so I made a little table for you, right? And it says, calculate the equilibrium constant. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to write out K. Okay. So K equals something. And the second thing you'll do is you'll plug in you, your concentrations. Now, if this was a general problem, gen general equilibrium calculation, all you would do is you would write K, and then you would look to see what you have. And then once you see what you have, then you know what you don't have, and you just solve for the thing you don't have. So I'll go over that, because I do two versions of this problem. So... Um, K all right, equals, so this is the first part, concentration of products over reactants. So I'm going to go concentration of CH3OH divided by CO times H2. And then at this point is when you should check just to make sure you wrote it right. So you guys remember, you see what I did wrong? Who sees what I did wrong? There's a two in the reaction. There needs to be a two in the equation. And the two, remember, is an exponent like this, because that's this two here. Okay. Now in a generic problem where it says solve for something, right? You can see like the, I have the CH3OH, I have the H2. And I have the CO, so I have the CH3OH, I have the H2, and I have the CO. So I have all the things I need to do the calculation with. Right? If something's missing, it's either that you don't need it or you're not solving for it. Or you, you know, if something's missing, sorry, you don't need it or you are solving for it. It's the thing you're looking for. I don't give you a K because it's asking you to calculate K. So now you just plug it all in. So... 0 0.0274. For those of you who hate writing units, actually one of the traditional things we do in these calculations, we don't write units. So I'm just doing, like even though you want to see units, we just don't write units. And there's a long, ugly explanation for it all. But we're not going to get into it. And so you have to make sure you can do these kinds of calculations. Your calculator using exponents, Powers other than two, you might have to know a power of three or something. Um, the, the button you're going to look for is either like it's going to say something like x squared or you're going to see a x to the n, I think it is. What is it? x to the... Oh, like this one shows x and then they leave a box or some of them show the caret. It's called a caret. It doesn't look like a caret. I don't know why it's called a caret. I'm sure at some point in my life I was super curious to know why, but I've passed that point, so we're good. Let's calculate, right? And we go 0 0.0274, then divided by 
0.105 divided by, you hear what I just said there? Because everybody wants to say times. But I'm doing it on my calculator in one line. I'm going to show you what I just typed in a second. Because I took, I took the top number, right, and I divided by the bottom number. But I also have to divide by the other bottom number. And I'm going to square it. And that comes out to be, for better or worse, 20.079. But it's only got three sig figs, so I'd round it there. And we don't write units. Its units would be like 1 over molarity squared or something if you wrote it out. So if you're rounding it, right, to sig figs, 20.0 is fine. Or let me say 20.1 is fine. 20.0 is not fine. So yeah, actually what I typed on my calculator looks like this. Oh, I just thought of something. I could just show you, but I don't even know how to do that right now. My brain hurts. So um, yeah, I typed something that looked like I'll write it down here, 0 0.0274 divided by 0 0.105 divided by 0 0.114 squared. I divided the stuff on the top by everything that's on the bottom. Now the other way to do it, just so you know, is to say 0 0.0274 Divided by, then use a parenthesis, and then say 0 0.105 times 0 0.114 squared, like that. That comes out to be the same thing on your calculator. Because what you're doing in the calculator on the bottom operation is to multiply the two things at the bottom. Because PEMDAS, parentheses, right? You multiply the things at the bottom together first, and then you divide it to the top. But if you're like in a hurry and don't want to worry about parentheses, that's what I'm talking about. I'm saying 0 0.274, and I divide by the 0 0.105, I get that number, and then I divide by the next one. Okay. Try it out, you get the same answer. Save some time, learn a little bit how your calculator works. Okay. Another problem. It says, if the concentrations of a different mixture are... And then I gave you some concentrations. Calculate the concentration of hydrogen gas. So again, same kind of problem, equilibrium concentrations. I'm going to hit K equals, and it's the same one that I did before, CH3OH divided by CO divided by H2 squared. And I'm looking for information at this point. So I wrote the K, now I'm looking for information. Let's see what we have, right? I have CO, so I have this. And I have CH3 with the wrong braces on the other. I got a brace instead of a bracket, but that's up here. Um, I didn't give you K because we're gonna use the K from the previous like problem. So we're gonna pull that K down. We're gonna use this number. Actually, we're using this number, to be honest. We're gonna plug that into here. So what do I have left of H2 squared, right? So now what we have to do is solve that. And to solve it, um, I have to rearrange it for H2. So I'm just gonna do it, but this is what you have to do. That's what we're looking for. I'm still going to have CH3OH over here. I'm still going to have CO over here. And then down here I'll have K. So what I did, the process, like the solving, remember I talked about this the other day, if it's on the bottom on one side, I bring it to the top on the other side. So all I did was I brought the H2 up and I put the K in its place. I just swapped. That's how I ended up.
Now that's not solve for h2, right? That's solve for h2 squared. So I gotta take the square root of both sides. So I'm gonna cross that out and I'm gonna take the square root. And that's what we're dealing with right there. Beautiful. I was just demonstrating the shot lease principle, I guess. So I have 0 0.058. I have 0 0.250. And then I have 20.079. So I got to do all that. So I'm going to do everything in the parentheses, and then I'm going to take the square root of it. Okay. I mean, everything under the radical, and then I'll take the radical. Square root point zero five eight divided by point two five zero divided by point twenty point zero seven nine. So H two squared. Is zero point zero one one five five. I'll take the square root of that, and I get H two equal to zero point one zero seven, and that's the concentration you'll have to assume. Because uh, everything's done in molarity units, that it's molarity. I probably should, I'll put that in there. Molar. Okay. Sorry, I ran out of space. I didn't anticipate. I forgot to put extra space in for that. So, um, questions on that? A lot of algebra. I think you guys can do it, but it's a lot of algebra. Remember, always write the K expression out, look for the values that you have, and then solve for the thing that you're looking for, and then solve the equation. All right, activation energy. We're gonna go back and kind of bring a couple of things together. So what is the activation energy? You guys remember what that is? yesterday. It's the energy required to make a reaction happen. It's like what you need to break a bond, okay? So activation energy is the energy required to make a reaction happen. And we actually control that with temperature and stuff like that. Um, or not, we, we control the rate of the reaction by controlling temperature and things like that. But the activation energy is like the hurdle that you have to go over to get to the product side or from the product side to the reactive side. And then equilibrium, we just finished talking about. It's like, it's like when the forward rate equals the reverse rate, right? So anybody know what a catalyst is? That idea. Yeah, speeds up a reaction. Catalyst is something that speeds up a reaction, but doesn't actually get used up in the reaction. So <clears throat> if you think about a reaction, let's think about energy. We're going to put energy on this axis. Okay, there's energy on this axis. And let's say you have reactants and you have products. And this is time. They usually call it the reaction coordinate. It's like the progression of the reaction, going from reactants to products. The way that chemists think about activation energy is if this is my reactants and this is my products, that, that I have a hurdle that I have to jump over, right? an energy barrier, that's the activation energy, that I have to get over so that I can form the products. This is the same reason why like, combustion reactions are spontaneous reactions, that they automatically will happen provided that 
you overcome the activation. It's the re activation energy is the reason why we just don't burst into flames while we're sitting on the toilet. Like they always, you know, I don't know if you've seen the spontaneous human combustion things. There's always some guy sitting on a toilet. I don't know why. Yeah, they, people will just, boom, they catch on fire. Right? That doesn't actually happen because of the activation energy. You have to get over that barrier. Usually how we get over the activation energy barrier, right, is with heat. So like these spontaneous human combustion stories where people talk about, oh, this person like caught on fire, found and burned to death. Usually it's on a toilet or something. Usually involve two things. You know what the two things are? It's kind of funny, actually. Alcohol and cigarettes. <laughs> These guys are smoking on the toilet, and they're drunk. And they fall asleep, drop the cigarette, pants catch on fire, smoke knocks them out, and they burn to death. I mean, it's, it's sad, but that's kind of how it happens. There's another one that I, I've read, because when you read about these things, you get like morbidly curious, about a guy in a tractor. But of course, he'd been smoking. He was working on his tractor, drinking. On a fire, found his upper. You know, it's gross, but anyways, yeah, that's usually what happens. It doesn't normally happen, but now here's the deal: there's a thing called a catalyst. A catalyst, right, can make the activation energy barrier smaller. So what it does is it usually reduces that activation energy. So what does that mean? the reaction can happen faster because it has less of a hurdle to get over. So if you think about yourself and you're running down, uh, down the street and there's like a, like a kid there. If it's a little kid, you could jump over him, right? If it's a big kid, what's gonna happen? You have to stop, go around, right, and go. So it's gonna slow you down. Or if you're running the hurdles, like I can't, but let's say you're running the hurdles. You know there's the big adult size hurdles and there's the little kitty size hurdles. I don't know if you've seen that on track means. You, if, you're, if, you're, if I'm running on the little kitty size hurdles, I can probably almost make it over the top, almost. I don't think I can actually do it anymore, but let's just pretend I could. So I'm running, if, I, if you put a big hurdle in front of me, what's gonna happen? You're slowing down, right? Slow way down because it's harder to get over the activation energy. So here's the deal. <clears throat> activation energy is affected by a catalyst. The catalyst makes this energy lower and so the reaction is faster. Equilibrium is determined by the difference in energy between reactants and products. The difference in energy between reactant and products tells you like, like this, but if I do that, all right, it's the difference in the height. This is potential energy of the, this part and potential energy of this part. That determines how much liquid ends up in both sides. So the actual, how much you get at equilibrium is only affected by the difference in energy, just like the difference in height here. That determines equilibrium. If I make this side lower, right, then the two sides become even. If I make this side higher, then I'll have more of this and less of this. More re less reactive, more product. So as it turns out, when you use a catalyst, you can make a reaction go faster, but the difference in energy doesn't change. And so as a result, you get the same amount of equilibrium. Okay? Okay, we're taking a break. Okay, so um, when we talk about gases, uh, one of the things just to start all this whole conversation off is we talk about how do gases behave, like how do they act. And there's a theory, it's called kinetic molecular theory, that's been used for a long time to understand like why gases do what they do. Like for example, why can you compress a gas and why does the volume of a gas increase when you increase temperature or decrease when you decrease temperature? If you increase the pressure on a gas, why does it get smaller or get big? You know, there's lots of properties of gases that we're trying to, to understand. And uh, kinetic molecular theory is probably the best theory that we have for this. So 
Uh, the first thing that kinetic molecular theory assumes is that gases are constantly in motion. They'll say in straight line motion. But that just means they're going to move in a straight line until they hit something. And then when they hit something, they'll bounce off of it in a straight line, so to speak. So that's if you have if this is a gas molecule, it'll move in a straight line like this, regardless of what's around it. Uh, the other thing that, that kinetic molecular theory assumes, uh, which is not true of real gases, okay, so this is just the idealized gas, is that uh, gas molecules are not attracted or repelled by each other. You can even add to that, they're not even attracted or repelled by the walls of the container that they're in, okay? So that means... If they were attracted to each other, or if they were attracted to the walls of the container, if two particles <coughs> passed each other, like this, and they were attracted to each other, they wouldn't actually travel in straight lines, they would do this. this that would be the ramifications of them being attracted. <coughs> if they were repelled, it would be the opposite. They would spread apart from each other all the time. So that's not happening. And so what we think about is they're just traveling in straight lines like this. If two of them pass, they pass like the other one doesn't exist. The other thing, kinetic molecular theory, and so, so back for a second, this is not actually true. But it's pretty close to true. It's not like you're telling, when you tell your kids, oh yeah, this stork brought you, that's just like a complete lie, right? So it's not that kind of not true. But but then, unless somebody believes that, I, mean, I don't want to dispel anything your parents told you. It's okay. You do come from storks. Uh, the other thing we, we that kinetic molecular theory uh, assumes, okay, is that they're very small compared to the distance between gas molecules. Um, the reason that's important is because if they were big, right, if there's not a lot of space in between, then the volume, oh, you can't read that, molecules, molecules, is that the word you can't read? Sorry. That didn't make it any better, but now you know what it says anyways. Yeah, if that wasn't true, then the volume inside the container, like the free volume inside the container, wouldn't actually be the same as the volume of the container because a lot of it would be occupied by the gas molecules. So, so basically they're saying when you have a container and it has a certain volume, the molecules, the container volume is the free volume that the molecules have to move around. The other thing, kinetic molecular, again, and this is not actually true, right? It's pretty close to true, but not actually true. This is actually, how about if I just do this? And then the last thing is, is that when we are talking about temperature, Temperature is related to the average velocity of the gas molecules. So if the temperature goes up, means right, increasing velocity. and kinetic energy. So having said that, and that is actually true, but thank goodness, because the top three actually aren't really true. But only having said all that, um, gases like oxygen gas in the atmosphere or nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, for the most part, behave like this is true. 
and we call these things ideal gases. So if a, if a gas molecule behaves in this fashion, we call this ideal behavior or ideal gases. So that's just all sort of the background. You don't really need to know much more about kinetic molecular theory than those four things, okay? Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to use those ideas to talk about, like, what is pressure? Why do gases behave the way gases behave, right? So, for example, pressure is defined as a force divided by an area. So I like to think in terms of balloons when I talk about pressure. So here's a balloon. Actually, see if I can draw a good balloon. I don't know. There's my balloon. It's got a string coming off of it. And it has gas molecules in it, right? draw some dots and it's complete if, it, if this is a gas right they're constantly moving and distributing within the container so actually based on the first two bits of information that we have from kinetic molecular theory right, one of the properties of a gas is that it completely fills the container that it's in so one of the reasons it completely fills the containers is in, it's, it's not attracted, they're not attracted to each other, they're not attracted to the walls of the container, they're just flying around in straight lines and so they uniformly fill the space inside the container. It, it turns out for real gases, right, they're actually attracted to each other a little bit and if you look at the edges of the container, like if you looked like over here in, in super high detail, like in this region around here, there would be actually a few fewer gas molecules on the edges of the container because they're actually sucked in towards each other. So the pressure of a real gas is always a little bit lower than what you would expect for an ideal gas, but for room temperature, for, for normal gases like nitrogen and oxygen and those things, it's pretty close to the same. And so it has ideal like behavior. So <clears throat> we, have a we have a balloon and it's filled with all these gas molecules uniformly filled inside the volume of the container. What creates the pressure of the gas, right? Well, the pressure of the gas is created by these molecules running into the sides like this or like that. They bounce off, right? And so I have gas molecules sort of hitting the wall like this. And it's called an impulse. So an impulse is like if I was a gas molecule, I do this so I have to wake myself up. What would I be doing? I'd be traveling in a straight line, right? And then I would hit something. And when I hit something, what happens? I bounce off. But you notice like if you bounce off a wall, like you can try this yourself. If you do this, you just walk like it's not there, right? Do you feel that force? Right? The wall is experiencing the same force, and that's the pressure. The molecules are running into the wall, and when they bounce off of the wall, they create that force. That's the force that we're talking about. So, <clears throat> this balloon is full, right? Because there's gas molecules bouncing off on the inside, lots of them bouncing off on the inside, creating a force that's pushing the walls of the balloon outward. The other part of this equation is the area. This is the area. It's the area of, of the balloon surface. Another way to think about it, though, is like, uh, this is the way I was thinking about it. Stand on my feet, right? And and you feel the pressure on your feet. Okay. 
lighting up. Hopefully it's not that light up. But if you're actually that light up, it's important. Well, what's happening is, that's worse, is, is that this is the area, right? What's creating the force? Me, right? So if I wait more, right, what happens to my the pressure on my feet? There's more pressure, right? So what's the solution to getting less pressure? Bigger shoes. <laughs> no, okay, lose weight. Yeah, all right. Get bigger feet. <laughs> Can't do that. Dang it. Okay, so. We'll talk about that some more because we have some other things that we're going to, uh, actually, you know what? Let me talk about it now. Talk about this a little bit more right now. I have some other things I want to talk about later related to this. So I don't know if you guys know this, but if you take a balloon and you fill it with a gas, just like those, and you heat it up, what happens to the balloon? It gets bigger, right? Right. So, so why is that happening, right? So, if you think about a balloon, let me just make another balloon. So, I'll put that for you. But here's my balloon, right? So if I take this thing outside and it gets hot, this balloon will get a little bit bigger. Why is it getting bigger? Think about kinetic molecular theory. Is the area changing when, when, it, when I heat it up? It is a little bit, right? But what else it must be changing? Temperature. The temperature changes. The kinetic energy of the molecule. So what's happening is a, you take the thing out of the heat, and the gas molecules get hot, they start moving faster. Now think about yourself, like if you're in the balloon and you're a molecule, well, that's a lot of it, but you're in, a balloon, in the balloon, you're a molecule, and you get hot, and you start running faster and faster and faster, when you hit the walls, there'll be more force. So when you heat a balloon, it expands. In fact, if you heat any gas, It expands right inside its container. The balloon gets bigger because the force, the kinetic energy of the molecules is increased. I'm going to abbreviate that Ke has gone up. So that means the force has gone up. So that means the pressure, right? It wants to go up. Now, if the pressure goes up, right, it's going to expand the balloon until the pressure on the outside of the inside is the same. Okay. So take this thing out. Right now, the balloon is the size it's at, if you think about it, because the pressure on the outside and the pressure on the inside are the same. If I make the pressure on the inside bigger, the balloon will expand, increasing the surface area, until the pressure on the outside is the same. And then it stops. So, Kinetic molecular theory helps us to understand behavior just like this. Now, what happens, think about this. I have a balloon, and again, on the balloon, I have pressure on the inside, and I have pressure on the outside. The pressure on the outside is made by the gas molecules outside. The elastic in the balloon actually has very little effect on that. It doesn't create that much force. It's just helping to find the boundaries of the force. If I go up in the mountains with this balloon, you may know what happens. It's it bigger. You guys ever buy potato chips in the valley and then go up to the mountains? And what happens to the bag of potato chips? It blows up or it gets just really big, and then you're always like, wow, that's really cool. 
Now, why did it do that? Did you actually go in and in, inject gas? Like you can go, like take your potato chip bag and go, oh, I've got a needle of gas. I'm going to shoot that in my bag and so it gets really big. <laughs> right, you didn't do that, did you? What happened? All right. Come on, my favorite thing is to do. Can you static it? My hair is a, it's a little too humid for that. If, you're, if it's really dry, you can rub a balloon on your head and stick it just about anywhere. So, sorry. So, I'm in the valley. Pressure inside, pressure outside is the same, right? I go up in the mountains, and all of a sudden it's bigger. Why is it bigger? Up in the mountains, there's less air, right? You know that. The pressure is actually lower. The reason you find it hard to breathe up in the mountains is because there's actually less air up in the mountains. There's less air pressure, and so the concentration of oxygen that gets into your blood is lower. And that's why you have a hard time breathing. When you're those guys that go up to uh, Mount Everest, right? You guys know about like altitude sickness. You heard about that? Like this is this year is like one of the worst years in history. There's like people dying. Because there's one of the things they say is a lot of wealthy people who want to go up from Mount Everest. Oh, I went on Mount Everest. Basically, they're going up there and making these long lines. And as people wait in the lines, they die because of altitude sickness. There's not enough oxygen up there. You've got to carry oxygen with you. Well, the reason that is, is the air pressure is so low. Well, why is the air pressure low up in high altitudes? A well, long story, but if you just think about it like this, the effects of low pressure are that there's fewer molecules at higher atmosphere. And if there's fewer molecules, there's less force created. If there's less force created, right, that's lower pressure. Now, the consequence for humans is when the pressure is lower, there's also less oxygen in the air. And then that's what altitude sickness gets caused by. Yeah, so pretty grim this year. A lot of people dying on Everest. But anyways... You go up to high altitude, there's less pressure on the balloon. And the pressure is what's keeping the balloon its size. All right? So when there's less pressure, the inside pressure pushes the walls of the balloon out until the inside pressure and the outside pressure are the same. And that's why it will get bigger as you go up to higher altitude. So this kinetic molecular theory helps to explain a lot of different things about behaviors of gases in general. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit now about what pressure is. Okay. The most common sense unit that we have is the atmosphere. The one that like people are like, if I tell you it's about one atmosphere pressure right now. We're talking about gases, right? The air around you is about one atmosphere. Why do we call it one atmosphere? Because it's the pressure of the, the gases around you, the atmosphere. So we use that as sort of a measure of the pressure. Uh, it's not used as much maybe as it used to be, um, but it is still a very common unit. Another common unit is called a millimeter of mercury. Millimeter of mercury. That's what this is. Now, what state is mercury? Liquid, right? It's, sort of the, it's of the elements on the periodic table. Uh, in their elemental form, you'll see there's two of them that are liquids. One of mercury and one of bromine, which is Br2, actually, elemental bromine. The way a barometer works is something like this. Let's say you take a tube. Uh, let's see, how do I want to do this? We're going to take a tube. And you fill it with mercury. All right, so let's actually do it like this. Take a tube like this. And you top it off and you put mercury liquid in here. So you have mercury. You put your thumb on it, because this is how they used to do it. Like, you know, mercury is super poisonous, right? But yeah, just stick a thumb on it. Who needs gloves? And they have a, bar they have a barrel of mercury or a, a cup of mercury a container and they would take it and they would invert it 
into this kind of a horrible drawing. So we go like this and we flip it over. This is full of mercury. I know it looks like a really bad hat, but still. It would fall, okay. And they would measure this height. And this height turned out to be 760 millimeters. Okay. So you notice this is this is empty. What's in there? Nothing. It's empty. Literally, it's empty. <laughs> it's a vacuum. Because you, you didn't allow it to come in, right? You just turned it over, and the mercuries would drop from the top. It didn't matter how long the tube was, it would drop, and every time it would drop, there would be 760 millimeters of mercury, that's where the unit comes from, in that tube. This is literally a vacuum. And a vacuum is just the absence of gas molecules. So it's just an empty space. There's nothing in there. Okay. So this is what we have. We have a force created by the mercury going downward. And then the atmosphere is pushing this way. So the molecules of the gas of the atmosphere are pushing on that surface. The mercury is trying to fall, but the atmosphere is keeping it pushed up. And the, it turns out, the thing about this, if, if the atmospheric pressure went down and there's less pressure pushing on the mercury, the column of mercury would drop because there's less energy or less force holding it up. If the pressure of the atmosphere, if this pressure here, if this pressure here goes up, then what happens is it forces the mercury to go up, right? And so the height of mercury was used originally as is the original measure of pressure that we have for the atmosphere. And this is what we call a barometer. Bar barometer just means atmospheric measure, of, of pressure measurement, gas measurement kind of thing. Yeah, so when you go to the papers and you look at the Fresno B and you say, oh, what's the atmosphere? You can look up the atmospheric pressure and the and people who like to do this, people go fishing. They like to look for changes in pressure. And so when you go from high pressure to low pressure, the theory is the fishing is better. So you read the barometric pressure every day. But be, being in the United States, we don't measure it in millimeters of mercury. We measure it in inches of mercury because we use the English system. And so one atmosphere of pressure in the English system is if you take 760 millimeters and convert it over to inches, it's 29.92 inches. That's normal atmospheric pressure. Now, all of these things that I wrote up here are actually one atmosphere of pressure, what we experience in our atmosphere. So another one is um, in PSI, because you guys know what PSI is, right? It's pounds per square inch. When you go, oh, your tar car tire needs to be 35 PSI, or your bike tire needs to be like 60 PSI, you just take a pump and you pump it up to that pressure, right? So PSI, pounds per square inch, oops, right. 14 Point seven pounds per inch squared is how you interpret that unit. Right, that's equal to one atmosphere. So it's seven sixty millimeters of mercury. That's also one atmosphere. And everybody's least favorite unit, unless you're a physicist, is the Pascal. But this is the standard unit now. And it's 101,325 pascals make one atmosphere. So the pascal unit is tiny, right? It's a very small unit. The last thing before we do some examples of pressure unit conversion 
um, is to talk about standard temperature and pressure. So lots of organizations have standard temperatures and pressures, especially if they're like certifying electronics, they'll have a standard, or the military has a standard temperature and pressure for different kinds of things. Um, they, they actually have several, I think. But in chemistry, and when we're talking about gases, okay, we're talking about standard temperature and pressure is one atmosphere and zero degrees Kelvin. So you'll see this a lot. They'll say at STP, they mean one atmosphere, seven, uh, zero degrees Celsius. Now, having said that, normally in gas calculations, this is 273.15 Kelvin. It's the Kelvin temperature scale that we use in all our calculations. So even though it says zero degrees Celsius, if you use it in calculation, use it as Kelvin. So we'll do a couple of practice conversion things. But these conversions are, are much like the conversions you're used to. Um, calculate your tire air, tire air pressure is 35 PSI. Okay. How many pascals or atmospheres does this represent? So we're going to do calculations at 35 PSI. And I'm going to do the first calculation. I'm going to do it in pascals. So it's 14.7 PSI, that's the pounds per square inch, right? That's that unit. For every, uh, then you go back up to here, 101,325 pascals. So you notice what I did that was different. Normally I have like one conversion factor and another conversion factor and we string them together. But what I did that was different in here is I know that all of these different numbers are equal to each other. So I can use any combination of them as a conversion factor. Don't know what the answer is, but it's 35 times 101,325 divided by 14.7. That comes out to be 241,250 uh, pascals. Two sig figs. So 2.4 times 10 to the 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's 10 to the 5th Pascals, okay, with two sigmas. If I want to convert that into atmospheres, by the way, uh, it's abbreviated ATM, just like the automatic teller machine, so... You go to the bank and you go to the ATM. So now you're going to the atmosphere. Or whatever, but it helps you be nerdy or not. Right. You're like, oh. 35 PSI. Right. And then I know if you're looking up here, all right, one atmosphere is the same as 14.7 PSI. Again, just using combinations of the units I have up there. 35 divided by 14.7. That comes out to be 2.38 ATM. My PSIs will cancel. And that rounds to 2.48 ATM. Typically, people 
un, on their feet, like when you feel like your feet are tired, you're experiencing less than one atmosphere of pressure. It's kind of weird to think about, but yeah, it's le- the pressure of your feet is typically less than one atmosphere, close to one atmosphere. But the other weird thing to think about is 2.35 atmospheres is enough pressure to hold your car up. Because that's the pressure of your car tires. Right. So that's actually, if you think about it in those terms, that's actually a lot of force that you can hold up with your car tire. Take a physics class, they'll explain it all to you. Okay, so we're gonna take a break. I'm gonna set up a demo and then... Um... So a little bit about, a little bit, bit of math, a little bit of covering about the math of, that we're gonna have to be used to using. Uh, one is the idea of direct proportionality. What does directly proportional mean? They, if one goes up, the other one goes up, right? So like in a mathematical equation, we could say like y is equal to x. So we would say that x is directly proportional to y or y is directly proportional to x because if I increased x, then y goes up, okay? okay. So, but, but in... If we want to say that's that's in in in, in, in a equal and equality, not inequality and equality, but in in gas terms, right? We would say like volume is proportional to temperature. That means we talked about that already. If you take a if you take a gas and you heat it, right? Temperature is going up, the volume goes up. That's directly proportional. Okay. If if we say pressure in moles, like quite literally, when you're taking a balloon and you're blowing it up, you're blowing moles of gas into the balloon. The balloon gets bigger, right? But but if if you have a container that you can't get bigger, if you blow into it, right, the pressure inside the container would go up. So pressure and and moles are directly proportional. Now, it turns out, right, early on in, in the study of gases, uh, they created uh, some empirical gas laws. Empirical gas laws, this is actually at the bottom, but I'm gonna do right up here. Empirical gas laws are just based on observation. And, and they look something like this. If I take and measure the volume and I graph it versus the temperature, okay, it makes a straight line. And I'm going to draw it like this, actually. It makes a straight line. And that's what a direct proportionality looks like. If you increase one, the other one goes up. Now, here's the thing. This thing had a slope, right? It has a slope on it. And it turns out that this line crossed at minus 273 Kelvin. So that was a weird point for the scientists because they said if you lower the keep lowering the temperature eventually the volume will be zero. Well then you can't go below that because you can't have less than zero volume. So that became known as absolute zero. You can't go below that temperature because you can't have a negative volume of gas. That's the lowest possible temperature. So it turns out if you do this same graph in Kelvin, it looks like this. And this is zero, and this is the units in Kelvin scale. This is the Celsius scale. This is the Kelvin scale. Now, how do you calculate a slope? It's rise of a run, right? The slope of this line turns out to be, if you take the volume, right? divided by the temperature that's proportional to the slope which I'll call I'll call it k because they always use k I would rather use m but m gets used for so many things in chemistry we're just going to use k 
And what they found for any gas sample, right, is that the volume and the temperature are always directly proportional to this constant. And so what they could say then is that if you had the volume of a gas at one condition divided by, uh, sorry, volume at, at one state, it's going to be proportion. It's going to be proportional to this constant, or equal to the. Sorry, it's going to be equal to a constant. Let's see. How do I want to do this? Kind of, I kind of worked myself in a circle here. Yeah, I'll just I'll just write the equation that it's going to be equal to the volume at a different state divided by the temperature of that state. And this equation says, in essence, that if you know the temperature and a volume and a temperature at a different state of the gas, you can calculate the volume at that temperature. So given three of those variables, you could calculate the volume at a different temperature. All you have to know is, is, is what the volume and temperature are at one other set of conditions, and you could predict any of the, any of the volumes or temperatures uh, at another set of conditions. This is what's meant by an empirical gas law. Now, for pressure and volume, Okay, it's an inverse proportionality. So what does that mean, right? On a graph, it looks like this. If I um, have pressure on this axis, actually, I think I do volume on this axis, and pressure on this axis, so think about a piston like this. And a guy named Boyle originally did this with mercury. But you have a piston. And you squeeze it down like this. So you, you, you take the piston and you push it down. What's that going to do to the pressure? Increase, right? Smaller volume, right? Higher pressure. And what Boyle found out is, in fact, when you do this experiment, it looks like that. And then he graphed it. He regraphed his data. He had pressure, and he graphed it as one over volume, and that became a straight line. And it had a slope, and we're just going to call it K. And, and then he said, uh, essentially this is what he said. He says, he said, if you take the pressure of one state times the volume at one state, that's going to be equal to K. So that the pressure at one state times the volume of one state will be equal to the pressure of a second state and a volume at a second state. Now there's a lot of these equations. This would be known as Boyle. These are both known as Boyle's Law. And I describe it down below. But Volume and temperature, this, these relationships are known as Charles' Law. And they're just named after the scientists who actually studied these different properties. And there's a whole bunch of these different relationships, but you can really get them all from one equation if you know what the variables are. So I'm going to tell you what the variables are, and I'll show you like the master equation. And then we're going to solve all the problems based on just the one equation.
it turns out Charles Law and Boyle's Law are really the only ones that really want you to know. Like, what do the, which variables do they relate and are they directly or inversely proportional? Okay, so those are the things I really want you to know. So the, the, a gas can be described by four different variables. It's the pressure, <clears throat> the volume, the temperature, and the moles. And <clears throat> and in the empirical gas laws, um, pressure and volume uh, don't need to have any particular units, but temperature always has to be in Kelvin. So this is where we have to get used to using the Kelvin scale. Okay. So um, I'm not going to go into all the details of how you get this equation, but I can describe it to you later in the, in the chapter. But for now, this equation looks like we're going to have this P1, V1 over P2, V2 is equal to N1, T1 over N2, T2. That's the equation that you'll use for solving lots and lots of different problems. Okay. And then I'll, I'll do some examples and you'll get to see like what do I mean by the different states? What do I mean by um, how to use this equation? That kind of stuff. Okay, so I'm going to make a little table when I do these problems. It's going to look like this. Oh, and this is not the only way to do these problems. Some people do this, just do them intuitively, right? By saying, oh, it's directly proportional, so if I increase it, I have to multiply it by this or divide by this. Some people will do that. <clears throat> I'll leave it up to you how you eventually do it. You can also look to see how the book does it. But I'm going to put P, V, N, and T here. Okay, so I don't know if you, you can see this in this equation. I'm going to put some notes in the table. I'm going to zoom in so you can see it. This is P1. This is V1. This is N1. Oh, I said I. Sorry. Old habit. And this is T1. I know you can't really, really, really see it like when I go back. But I just, I'm going to be plugging numbers in there. I just want you to kind of see, like, what the table actually represents. The equal sign is right here. Or actually, it's right here. And this is going to be P2, V2, N2, and T2. And then we're going to read the problem, and we're going to... We're going to see which values we have, and then I'll show you how to deal with the other things. Okay? But really, this little table, what it's doing is it represents the equation, and you're just going to be filling in numbers into the equation, and then we'll be solving it for whichever variable we need to solve for. So it says that if the temperature of a gas increases from 25 degrees Celsius to 125 degrees Celsius and initially had a volume of 25 milliliters. What's its final volume? Okay. What are the 25 and the 125? Temperatures, right? And which one's T1? 25, because it's the one that you start at, right? So this is 25. Now, if you remember the Kelvin, because temperature has to be in Kelvin, so I'm going to put a little note here, Kelvin. Kelvin you get by taking the degree Celsius and adding 273.15 to it.
So what I'm going to do in the table here, I'm going to say plus 273.15. I'm just going to add it to the end. Now for T2, that's 125. So that's plus 273.15. That's giving me my second temperature. That's my second state. They talk about states of the gas. So I have a gas under one set of conditions. I changed the conditions. Now I'm calculating for the new set. So now what's 25 milliliters? Your initial volume, yeah? Because it's V1. It's where you started. So this is 25 milliliters. And what is it asking for? The final volume. So really what I'm solving for is V2. So this is what you're going to do when you, when you write this problem out. Now this is a Charles Law problem because it's volume and temperature. Okay? Charles Law was volume and temperature. I didn't say that, but we still ended up, it turns out, we ended up with Charles Law. So what I'm going to do is this. What did it say about pressure? No, what did it say about pressure? Nothing, right? So this is what you assume. Pressure didn't change. So if the pressure doesn't change, that means these two are equal to each other, right? What's going to happen in the equation? If pressures are equal to each other. They cancel, right? You can just cross them out. So I don't need that information. What did it say about the moles? Nothing. So assuming the moles didn't change. It doesn't say anything about adding gas or anything like that. So you can assume that these will cancel out. So what you're left with then is actually a rewritten version of Charles' law. It's V1 over V2 is equal to T1 over T2. Now it's actually, you know, one times V1 over V2 or one times T1 over T2, but they canceled, so I'm just leaving the ones out. And I'm solving for V2. So now I have to rearrange the equation. And again, there's like a billion ways to do this. So I'm going to, I usually, when I have like on both sides, I think about it like this. I have V1 times T2 is equal to T1 times V2. Because I just cross multiplied this, the denominators. I just brought them across. And then I'm going to bo divide both sides by T1. So I'm going to have V2 is equal to um v1 times t2 over t1 okay so having said that i can plug some values in I'm going to have to do some calculatings for my temperatures. So that's going to be the top. This one's 298.15. Uh, 125 plus plus 273.15. That's 398. Oh, yeah, that was easy. 0.15. I said that it had 100 to it. Huh? 398.15. And so I have 25 milliliters. And then T2 is uh, 398. This will be in Kelvin. And this will be 298.15 Kelvin. Like that. The units of Kelvin will cancel out. And this is why in these empirical gas laws, you can get away with, like, as long as the units are the same, they'll cancel. But in, in temperature, it always has to be Kelvin. 
So I have 398 divided by 298.15 times 25. And the new volume is 33 milliliters. It's like 33.4, but I rounded. So that's like one way to do these problems, where you just set up the equation, you do the calculation. The way that some people will do it is they'll say, okay, volume and temperature are directly proportional, right? And they calculate this ratio. When you say directly proportional, you're talking about how much the, the, the volume increased by the same ratio that the temperature increased, and you just multiply it together. But that's what that equation means when you say it's directly proportional. This is the factor by which the volume will go up. And then you just multiply it by the original volume. Okay, we'll do another one. It says, I'm gonna set up my table. I'm gonna write my equation. I'm gonna cancel out the stuff I don't need. And then I'm gonna solve and plug values in. So my table is going to look like this again, P, V, N, and T. I have one and I have two. I have my columns, right? And then I have my equations. So I'm going to rewrite it. P1, V1, over P2, V2 is equal to N1, T1, over N2, T2. And I'm going to read through my problem. It says, if a gas has a volume of 255 centimeters cubed at 725 millimeters of mercury, what is the volume at 760 millimeters of mercury? So, what's the 255 centimeters cubed? It's your volume. It's your initial volume. So, B1. So, it's 255. I'm going to write centimeters cubed down here because I'm going to make sure the units are always the same. And then what's uh, 725 millimeters of mercury? What's that unit? Pressure, right? So I'm going to write, that's my P1, right? So that's 725 millimeters of mercury. And then it says, what's the volume at 760 millimeters of mercury? So that's my P2, that's 760. And what am I looking for? Volume, so that's my V2, that's what I'm solving for. What did it say about moles? What did it say about temperature? Nothing, right? So that means these are equal to each other. And that means these cancel out. Now, I have to put something there. It's not zero. What is it? It's one, yeah, because I can, yeah. Anything divided by itself is one. So now I have this equation. It's funny how when you don't do like algebra for a while, you're like, what do I put there? I have to think about it all the time. I have this equation. What do I need to solve for? V2. So I'm just going to go like this. V2 is equal to P1 V1 over P2. I just brought this up to the other side. And now I can plug numbers in and get an answer. So like V2 is equal to 725 times, oh, millimeters of mercury, right, times 255 centimeters cubed divided by 760 millimeters of mercury. The millimeters of mercury will cancel out, and then I can just do my calculations. 
So 725 times 255 divided by 760. I end up with 200. V2 is going to end up being 243 centimeters cubed with three sig figs. Does that answer, like the first answer made sense, temperature went up, the volume went up. Does this answer make sense? It kind of does and kind of does it, right? It does, it's correct, but you have to think uh, like it's a piston, right? And the volume went from being 255 to 243, so that must mean the final pressure is higher than the initial pressure. Right. Thinking through like how the variables change, that that you you would if it's a piston and you have it at 255 centimeters cubed and then you brought it smaller, that means the final pressure should be higher. Okay. Do one more. So what am I going to do? What's the first thing? Table, right? I'm gonna draw my little table out. One and two, and that's P one and V. Oh, sorry, P, V, N, and T. Now I'm gonna write my equation because I'm gonna need to cancel stuff out. I think so. I have P one, I have V one, I have P two and V two. That's equal to N1 and T1 over N2 and T2. Okay, so let's read here. It says, a uh, cylinder contains one and a half moles of gas and has a pressure of 35 psi at 26 and a half degrees Celsius. If two moles of gas are added and the temperature is decreased to 10 degrees Celsius, what is the final pressure inside the container? Like, I don't know why anybody would do that, but this is the kind of problem that you see. So 1.5 moles, right? What is that? That's N1, right? And then has a pressure of 35 PSI. That's P1. Now this is in PSI. This is in moles. And then at 26.5 degrees Celsius, so I'm going to put 26.5 degrees Celsius plus 273.15. So now it says if two moles of gas are added, what is N2? It's not two. Three and a half, right? Yeah, yeah three and a half. Because you're adding two, so it's 3.5. It's the phrasing here, are added. And then what's T2? Decreased by 10 degrees, right? 16.5? Yeah. Plus 273.15. And what are we looking for? What is the final pressure? So that's P2. And volume. Anything mentioned about volume? No, nothing about volume. So these are presumed to be equal to each other. And that means the volumes will cancel out. So now I have to rearrange the equation. And honestly, this is the part that usually gets people, is just rearranging equations, just practice. I'm gonna have P2 is equal to P1 times N2 
times T2 divided by N1 and T1. typo there, I just changed it. So now we just have to plug values in. There's a lot of values to plug in. So we're going to go ahead and just do it. Um, P1 is 35 ATMs. N2 is 3.5 moles. And then 273 plus 16.5 273.15 plus 16.5 plus 17.5 plus 17.5 is 289.65. And then on the bottom, I'll have N1 and T1. So it'll be 1.5 moles and 26.5 plus 273.15. 299.65 Kelvin. The moles will cancel, the Kelvin will cancel, and so that leaves me with the units of atmospheres. So my calculation is 35 times 3.5 times 289.65 divided by 1.5 divided by 299.65. And now the pressure is 78.9 atmospheres. So that'll round out to 79 atmospheres. Two sig figs because the 35 and the 3.5 and the 1.5 all two sig figs. So are decreasing the temperature not by very much, but you're increasing the number of moles by a lot. Like a factor, the ratio of moles increases quite a bit. So the pressure goes up. No, you don't have to change to PS... Well, do I ask for a... Wait, 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 wait. What is my unit? Oh, it's in PSI, sorry. My bad. This is PSI. That's what's correct. If you want an ATM, then you have to go. Thank you. All right. I think that is a good stopping point. We're about halfway through the chapter, so there's still a lot of calculations left. I'll get these posted tonight along with the video, so try to keep up with the homework.